Hey there, chemists. In our last lesson, we were talking about the difference between real gases and ideal gases. And we looked at this animation and saw how particles can have forces of attraction, which cause them to behave less ideally in the gas phase. And we see things like different pressures than what we would normally calculate from the ideal gas law. We haven't yet talked about what those forces of attraction are. That's what today is all about. So remember from much earlier in our year together, we, we broke down every single substance into one of these four categories, the network covalent substances, ionic substances, metallic and molecular substances. First, so first let's just quickly review what those mean, and then we're gonna focus in on what types of attractive forces these things have. Network covalent solids are really, really specific, and one way to talk about the forces of attraction is to look at their melting point, the, just the temperature at which it goes from solid to liquid at a given pressure. Network covalent solids typically have really high melting points, things like glass, which is usually made of some type of silica, or graphite, if you're writing with a pencil, that's what you have right now, solid carbon. These melt in the thousands of degrees Celsius. The reason for that is the structure is made up of a continuum of covalent bonds. And you actually break those covalent bonds when you melt the substance from liquid to solid. This is the only time this happens. Every other time you break an interparticle attraction, but here we're breaking an intraparticle attraction between the carbon atoms or the silicon atoms or whatever it is. How do you know if you have a network covalent solid? For this class, I'm only gonna talk about those two, silicon dioxide, and carbon, elemental carbon, which remember occurs as graphite and diamond. So there are actually three, if you think about it, how you would write it out. There are certainly others, but those are the three most common. Silica, carbon as graphite, and carbon as diamond. The other type of substance we have right next to it is ionic substances. That's a metal and a non-metal, a cation and an anion. So something like magnesium oxide or sodium chloride. Again, we're just gonna look at their melting points to talk about their strengths of attractive forces. These are made up of electrostatic interactions and the melting point increases, the attraction increases when the ions are smaller and when the charge has a greater magnitude. This is based on what's called Coulomb's law. So let me just go over to uh, a sidebar just for a second and look at the equation for Coulomb's law. You'll learn more about this in physics. We're just gonna talk about it qualitatively in chemistry. So if I compare the ions in magnesium oxide with the ions in sodium chloride, why do the magnesium oxide particles have stronger Coulombic attraction? For what we just said, they have smaller sized ions and the, mag the magnitude of the charge is greater. In the equation at the top there, you can see that the energy of the Coulombic attraction is a constant K times the product of the two charged particles. For us, that's the magnitude of the charge of the ions divided by the distance that separates their nuclei. So that's proportional to how big the ions themselves are. Charge is usually more important than size when it comes to the Coulombic attraction, because if you think about it, a charge doubling really will impact the force of attraction. And the size of ions, it's really uncommon to compare two species where one might be double the size of the other, but they both impact uh, the Coulombic attraction. Okay, so let's make a note of that. The melting point increases with smaller size and greater charge. The third category we have are metallic substances. Again, if we look at the melting points of just a metal like lithium or sodium, they're typically lower melting than the first two. It actually depends on the metal and there's a lot of variety in melting points. The first two columns of the periodic table have a pretty reliable trend though, where the melting point typically increases with smaller radius. They can pack more tightly together and it's harder to, to separate the atoms when they liquefy. The last one, the one we're gonna spend most of today talking about are these molecular substances. These are also just covalent compounds. That's what the word molecule means. Just non-metals forming strong covalent bonds, things like glycerol or wax, which respectively melt at 20 and 40 degrees Celsius. These are totally different from the other three types of categories. They are discrete molecules. These look like little P4, remember tetraatomic phosphorus molecules. And when they melt, we have to break what are called the intermolecular forces or IMFs. Molecular substances are the only ones that have IMFs. The other three categories we talked about are very different. So now let's go into what those types of IMFs are. You probably learned about these in an earlier chemistry class, but here they are again. There are three. 
They're called dispersion forces, dipole forces, and hydrogen bonding or H bonding. And it's important to remind yourself that these are attractions between separate molecules. These are intermolecular attractions, not intra, not within the same molecule, at least not in terms of a covalent bond. The dispersion forces, sometimes called London dispersion forces, uh, occur because a molecule's electrons can polarize to create what's called an induced dipole. Every molecule has these forces because every molecule has electrons. Bigger molecules have more electrons and therefore bigger molecules have stronger London dispersion forces. So if we see a physical property like the melting point or the boiling point of a substance and it's noting that there's particularly strong attractive forces there, it's probably because it's a big molecule. Plastics and polymers have this. Even though they're nonpolar and they don't have any other type of force of attraction, this is what we see uh, in really large molecules. So if I compared just two really small molecules, here's methane and here's silane. They're both small, nonpolar, gaseous molecules in standard conditions. But silane has a much higher boiling point than methane. That's because it's bigger, it has more electrons, it has more polarizable electrons, and they start to attract to each other because of that. That's what the induced dipole is. There's no inherent dipole, it's nonpolar. But once the two molecules start to get close to each other, they start to segregate their, their electron clouds, and it looks like it has a partial dipole. That's what the induced dipole means. The second one, what are called dipole forces, or dipole-dipole forces, is really the same kind of attraction but it has to do with polar molecules, and there's an existing dipole that's already there. So these molecules are already polar, so there's just a stronger attraction there. More polar molecules will have stronger dipole-dipole attractions and usually create things like higher melting points and higher boiling points, of course. So if you compare silane, which is nonpolar, with HCl, which is polar, that's just a diatomic uh, binary H and Cl molecule, it's got a net dipole toward the more electronegative chlorine. It has these existing dipoles and they will line up and cause an attractive force. So HCl has a much higher boiling point than uh, SiH4 and they otherwise have pretty similar electron counts. So we would assume that these two have pretty similar LDFs and it's the dipole-dipole forces that really explain this drastic difference in boiling point. The third force no doubt you've heard of from other science classes is called hydrogen bonding. This is a special intermolecular force and it exists very specifically between a lone pair in a molecule somewhere, an unshared pair of electrons, that happens to be on one of the three smallest most electronegative elements on the table, nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. It has to be one of those three. We don't see it so far with other elements on the table. And it's bonding to a hydrogen atom on a different molecule that's also got to be directly attached to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So there are very specific requirements for this to occur, and it's because of the polarization of the H bonded to that atom, and it can start to form a partial bond. Uh, it's not a covalent bond. It's still an intermolecular attractive force between two molecules. So we see this with something like water molecules, and we see it with HF molecules. And there's the IMF. Remember, it's between separate molecules. So a lone pair, as long as you have one, you can form a partial bond, a hydrogen bond, with a hydrogen on another molecule, as long as it's also bonded to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Water is notoriously good at this because water has two lone pairs and two hydrogen atoms. So every single participant gets to participate in hydrogen bonding. Every lone pair, every H gets to match up with somebody else. HF can't do this because you have only one H and three lone pairs, so there's going to be a lot of lone pairs that aren't participating. It's still got H bonding, and it's much higher boiling than, let's say, HCl right below it on the periodic table, and that's because of the H bonding. Okay, so those are the three types of intermolecular forces that we see with covalent compounds. Now let's look at a bunch of different molecules and their boiling points and see if we can explain just a couple of the, the differences. What I want you to do is hit pause, look at each structure, and see if you can classify which intermolecular forces exist for each of these compounds. Of the three, do they have only one of them, do they have two, or do they have all three? Hit pause, try that now, we'll come back and check. Okay, let's see how you did. Ammonia has all three. 
Every molecule has LDFs, so I'm writing that for all of them. If you did that, good job. Ammonia is also polar. Remember, it's not totally symmetric, so it will be slightly polar. Only totally symmetric molecules have no dipole moment in the beginning, like carbon tetrachloride right next to it. Carbon tetrachloride is not polar. There's also no hydrogens, so it only has LDFs. It only has dispersion forces. BF3 also only has LDFs. Chloroform, CHCl3, has LDFs, but it also has dipole forces. Even though it's tetrahedral, it's not completely symmetrically arranged because we have one hydrogen and then three chlorines at the other vertices of the tetrahedron, so there is a dipole. But that hydrogen can't H-bond. It's not attached to an N or an O or an F. H-bonding is really specific. PCL5 only has LDFs, CO2 only LDFs, SF6 only LDFs, and the last one, methanol, has all three that could form hydrogen bonds as well. So if we look at just a few of them, let's actually just look at the first two. Ammonia boils at negative 33, and carbon tetrachloride boils at 77. That's a very big difference in boiling point at atmospheric pressure. Carbon tetrachloride is a liquid, and ammonia is a gas. But carbon tetrachloride only has LDFs, and ammonia has all three. So what's going on here? Well, it must be that the LDFs are just that much stronger than the combined forces of ammonia. So carbon tetrachloride boils higher than ammonia, which is a little bit surprising when you first look at them because you would think more types of forces is stronger. Not necessarily. We have to look at the data and then make sense of it. And it's because the LDFs in CCL4 are stronger than the combined IMFs in ammonia. A lot of students accidentally think, oh, once I see something that's H-bonding, that's a really strong force, that's got to be the winner. Well, H-bonding is a strong force, and it's a unique one, but other forces can be really strong. If molecules are really big, they tend to have strong London dispersion forces. Look at PCL5 right in the middle. It boils at 167. Uh, that's the highest one in this series, and it makes sense when you look at it. That's a big molecule, heavy atoms, lots of electrons, lots of induced dipoles as a result of that. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about today is just one other property that we look at that it can be explained by intermolecular forces. Uh, and it also reminds us what the boiling point of something really is. It's called the vapor pressure. We've seen this before when we talked about gases. Every substance has a vapor, a certain amount of it in the gaseous phase, and it only depends on what the substance is and what temperature you're at. That what predict, that's what predicts the vapor pressure. Here's a picture that shows just how vapor pressure increases with temperature. When you have something cold versus something hot, there's more and more particles in the gas phase as you heat something up. You don't necessarily have to boil it to have vapor. There's always a, a gaseous amount of substance in equilibrium with its liquid or even its solid state. And we use this to talk about IMFs and differences in phases. So the vapor pressure of something increases as temperature increases. As long as you heat it up, it will get warmer. Uh, it will get more vaporized. It's not linear, though. So here's just a rough sketch of what the vapor pressure curve looks like for water. And this separates the two phases we see, the liquid from the gaseous phase. And this is essentially the boiling point line. Vapor pressure also increases as intermolecular forces decreases. And that should make sense because intermolecular forces keep the particles together. They don't want to vaporize. They don't want to escape into the gas phase. So if we have weak intermolecular forces, that substance is going to escape into the gas phase more easily and it's going to exert more vapor. You're going to have a higher vapor pressure. So if I compare the curve for water with, let's say, another substance, just like a nonpolar hydrocarbon like pentane, it might look something like that, where at every single temperature along the x-axis, it is higher than water because water would no doubt have stronger IMFs uh, than, than pentane. And this shows us that. Now, what's the boiling point uh, of these substances? Well, the boiling point is when your exterior pressure uh, is equal to the vapor pressure. So here's an arbitrary line where we're experiencing right now one atmosphere. And if I draw that horizontally and then drop down verticals to the x-axis, where it hits the x-axis is the boiling point. It's where your external pressure equals the vapor pressure for a given substance, which means the boiling point is not just a temperature, but it's a temperature at a certain external pressure. So we can change the boiling point of something by simply changing its external pressure. Boiling occurs when the vapor pressure is equal to the surrounding pressure. 
So for both of these, this is essentially the boiling point line of a substance. If you take water to a higher altitude, like Denver, Colorado, compared to New York City, you'll see that it boils at a lower temperature because it hits that external pressure. The vapor pressure hits that external temperature at a lower temperature. Okay, so today we talked about uh, a recap of sort of all kinds of substances, network covalence, ionics, metallics, focusing mostly on molecular. Remember, those are covalent things. Those are the only ones that have the intermolecular forces, what we abbreviate often as IB, IMFs. Uh, you can tell what kinds of IMFs a substance has based on its structure. They all have dispersion forces. Polar molecules have dipole forces, and special cases can result in hydrogen bonding. And we can use it to explain the differences we see in things like boiling point, melting point, or the vapor pressure of a substance. There's a little summary here at the bottom that sort of summarizes all that. Thanks for watching.